C.S. Lewis, who doesn't like him? C.S. Lewis is the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. He's not only popular in the world, but also among Christians for his literature and Christian apologetics. For example, Mere Christianity. Pardon, ich bin Christen, German. He's not only well known in the world, but also among Christians, albeit, let it be Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, Nandinam. In other words, the world loves C.S. Lewis. In other words, C.S. Lewis was a false teacher. Oh, how can you say that? Now, what would Jesus say? Jesus said in Luke 6, 26, Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Everyone talks good about C.S. Lewis. Some people just like the Chronicles of Narnia, because it's just a good fantasy book, and others maybe like his writings on Christian apologetics. Everybody likes him. Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. C.S. Lewis was a false prophet. Unfortunately, he's considered to be a really good Christian author. Oh, the Chronicles of Narnia and its Christian references, and his book Mere Christianity, which is really popular. That guy was a false teacher. How do I know that? There's a clear statement from Jesus himself. Someone who's always good spoken of, who calls himself a Christian. But you know what? For so did their fathers to the false prophets. He was a false teacher and he wasn't saved. Unfortunately, your favorite C.S. Lewis he is burning in hell today. Actually, I could end the podcast right here and just warn you about C.S. Lewis. But let me just show you some of the false teachings. Let me show you why false teachers are just loved by the world. Why does everybody talk good about this guy? I'm going to quote something from one of his books. And you tell me, was he Christian or not? I'm going to quote from Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. That was a book where C.S. Lewis is writing a letter to a fictional friend in which he meditates on prayer to get a deeper understanding of his theology and his conception of faith. And he writes in his book, to search for some quotations, Of course I pray for the dead. Sounds good, right? It's a good start right there. Of course I pray for the dead. So basically, where's it going? It's at least going in the direction of necromancy. What the Lord hates? What's occult, right? Should I even have to say yes? Of course I pray for the dead. As if it's like, what's well, of course Christian, of course it's biblical. It actually comes from, if you for example read the Catholic Catechism, it actually comes from the Apocrypha, from the Book of Maccabees. It doesn't come from the Bible, right? Of course I pray for the dead. According to the traditional Protestant view, all the dead are damned or saved. Bingo. If they are damned, prayer for them is useless. That's right. If they're saved, it's equally useless. Correct? God has already done all for them, what more should we ask? But don't we believe that God has already done and is already doing all that he can for the living? What more should we ask? Yet we are told to ask. Yes, it will be answered, but the living are still on the road. Further trials, developments, possibilities of error await them. But the saved have been made perfect. They have finished the course. To pray for them presupposes that progress and difficulty are still possible. In fact, you're bringing in something like purgatory. Well, I suppose I am. I believe in purgatory. Quote from C.S. Lewis. And that's the guy who's held high even by the non-denom churches. Mere Christianity, what a great book, right? I recommend that for Christian apologetics. That guy was a damnable false teacher. He's burning in hell, not in purgatory, which isn't in the Bible. He's in hell. Woe unto you, and all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Hey, get away from your C.S. Lewis, from your role model. I don't care what Christian references are there in the Chronicles of Narnia. Do you know what? Maybe it's a really good work of fantasy. Maybe you could read it just for entertainment. And I've got no idea. I haven't read it. I've just seen a movie. It was a long time ago and I don't really remember it. But C.S. Lewis is not a Christian role model in any shape or form. He was a false teacher. That's what he was teaching. Obviously, there's so-called Christians who go to false churches and are unfortunately confused. Who are not saved. When someone is preaching a false gospel, let it be verbally or through a book, guess what? He's a false teacher. Well, I suppose I am. I believe in purgatory. 
That means that C.S. Lewis did not understand the gospel. He didn't understand what it means to be saved. He didn't get it at all. Or else he wouldn't be believing in purgatory. You know, his argument was basically, hey, we are praying, of course, for the living. Therefore, we should also pray for the dead. As he writes, but don't we believe that God has already done and is already doing all that he can for the living? Yet we are told to ask. So basically, he's making this straw man argument. That's what his argument is. It's a straw man argument. So he's making a straw man argument. God has already done what he can do for the living. What more should we ask? Now, that's a load of crap. So what he's saying is exactly what the Calvinist would say, that prayer is useless. That's what Calvinists say. This is what they say. God has done everything, and he'll do everything else. He knows what's best. So it doesn't matter if you ask or not. Prayer doesn't matter. We should nevertheless pray. Why do we ask? Why do we pray to God? It doesn't make sense. It's not what the Bible says. Is this a straw man argument what it is? The Bible says very clearly, Ye have not, because ye ask not. Now, why don't we Christians have certain things in life? Now, I'm not talking about sinful things, but I'm talking about meaningful things, things that are benefiting and are pleasing to God. Well, it probably has to do with the fact that we haven't yet asked the Lord. So what the Bible says, He have not, because He asked not. So no prayer is not useless. So He makes the straw man argument. Yeah, God has already done and is already doing all He can for the living. What more should we ask? And yet we are told to ask. So He's like, Hey, let's all now pray for the dead. Logical conclusion. Let's now pray for the dead. He then gives a contradiction. Yes, it'll be answered, but the living are still on the road. Further trials, developments, possibilities of error await them. But the saved have been made perfect. They have finished the course. To pray for them presupposes that progress and difficulty are still possible. In fact, you're bringing in something like purgatory. I believe in purgatory, he admits it. Why? Because he didn't understand salvation, what it means to get saved. He thought that the deceased saints are still on their way, just like the living ones, they're still on the road, like something still waiting for them. So basically, the deceased saints are not really saved. They still have like way ahead of them. They're still in the process. He sees salvation as a process. It's not a one-time event what it is, but he sees salvation as a process. So in other words, the dead saved, they're not really saved. But they go to the purgatory first and must be purified, and then at some point they get saved. Purgatory is a damnable heresy. It's a false gospel that someone teaches through it. Well, maybe you're saying, Brother Anzel, you're just taking some quotes out of context, although you've explained something. You just totally took it out of context. You're just throwing a bad light on C.S. Lewis because you don't like him. But I'm not the only one who understands what's black on white here. You've just got to understand what it says in simple English. Because it's so clear. I believe in purgatory. C.S. Lewis believed in the purgatory. A false prophet. He's in hell. There's no purgatory. Well, I'm not the only one who understands his clear statements. For example, Jerry Waltz writes in a book about purgatory, in a chapter about C.S. Lewis. It says right there in the gist of the chapter, Although not a Roman Catholic, C.S. Lewis, the most popular Christian writer of the 20th century, believed in purgatory. This is significant, because his influence in Protestant and evangelical circles is perhaps especially strong. Mm -hmm, that is quite significant. This chapter shows not only that Lewis believed in purgatory, but also that it is integral to his theology of salvation. It is shown that Lewis affirmed a sanctification model of purgatory that may be appealing to the Protestants as well as Roman Catholics. What an amazing Christian, right? Who brings the Protestants and the Catholics together. So let's all just get ecumenical. Let's all believe in a purgatory. Let's all believe in a false gospel. Kumbaya. But Jesus says in Luke 16, 15, And it said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. It is highly esteemed among men. To bring all kinds of Christians together, let's all just focus on what's peaceful and common. We're going to be ecumenical. Let's not offend anybody, right? Well, don't call them false teachers. Just believe a little differently than us, right? Basically, we're all just one. 
That's highly esteemed among men. That's false Christianity. In a review about C.S. Lewis's book Mere Christianity, it says, Lewis writes deliberately and openly not as a professional theologian, but as a very ordinary layman in the Church of England. That's obviously the church from where pure and biblical theology comes. Not. He pleads neither for Anglican Christianity, nor for the theological characteristics of any denomination. Wonderful. But for a mere Christianity, or plain Christianity, in which everyone can fan himself. Now, is that the right Christianity in which everyone can find himself? Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. The real and biblical Christianity is when compared to the entire world population, only for few people. There's only few people that get saved. You see, the most people are on the broad way, the white path. It's a straightforward way that leads to destruction. And that's mere Christianity, or plain Christianity, which isn't really Christianity. It's got nothing to do with the Bible, where everyone can find himself. You know, that's just false religion simply summarized. Because what does Jesus mean here? For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there at. That's all the false religions. It's also false Christianity. Where everyone can find himself. Where probably even Muslims can find themselves. We're gonna come to that later. It's not a joke by the way. Where the Hindus can find themselves. It's just like one world religion. That's all the false religions. The broad way. Cause all false religions. Just like false Christianity, teach salvation by works, or through achieving a higher standard, to achieve something higher, through works, through your own efforts. No one can achieve that. If there is no purgatory, you either believe in Jesus, have your sins forgiven, and have eternal life, and you go to heaven, or not. A mere Christianity where anyone can find themselves is a false Christianity. It's exactly the same as every other false religion. It's just works-based salvation. It's very few who find biblical Christianity. Here's the thing, to get saved is easy. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But you know, a lot of people stumble upon Jesus nevertheless. They stumble upon Jesus. Although salvation is easy, because a lot of people are prideful. A lot of people want to hold on to their own good works. And they don't want to. Simply admit that they deserve to go to hell. A lot of people are just too prideful and that's the main problem. Why they don't get saved? They stumble upon it on the rock of offense on Jesus. That's how it's referred to. A rock of offense. So should we believe that real Christianity is where everyone finds themselves? Where Jesus himself is a rock of offense? That's false teaching. Let me give you an example for this mere Christianity from his book Mere Christianity, or better put, Mere False Teaching. So this particular quote, I just got it from this review, whose source you'll find in the description below. And C.S. Lewis writes, Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start Theories as to how it did this are another matter. A good many different theories have been held as to how it works. What all Christians are agreed on is that it does work. So the death of Jesus has, yeah, somehow put us right with God and has given us a fresh start. A good many different theories have been held as to how it works. What all Christians are agreed on is that it does work. <laughs> well, he's writing about what Christ has done on the cross. He's kind of verbalizing it in almost his own words. And it's so clear when you just read it that he didn't understand the gospel. He just cannot summarize the gospel in words that make sense. He doesn't know what the gospel is. He doesn't know what Christ did for us. The death of Christ is somehow but is right with God. And you know what? What I mentioned before a Christianity where everyone can find themselves, probably also the Muslims. Muslims can probably find themselves according to this quote. Because according to the Muslims, Jesus Christ is seen as a prophet highly regarded. I'm not trying to say something positive, please don't misunderstand me. Muslims blaspheme Christ with their disgusting Quran, because their Quran says that God has no son. That's blasphemy. Well, I'm not trying to say something positive. 
but it's a fact that they consider Jesus Christ to be a prophet. And Muslims, according to this quote, probably would agree a little bit that Christ is somehow put as right with God. Well, he did that somehow as a prophet, but he lived a good life. And that's how we get right with God. Christianity where anyone can find himself. He was a false teacher. He didn't understand what the gospel truly is. But let me read another quote. We do know that no man can be saved except through Christ. We do not know that only those who know him can be saved through him. Let me repeat that. Only those who know him can be saved through him. That we don't know. I'm not getting this worse in my mind right now. Just give me a little bit of time. I'm not getting the worse in my mind. All right, now I found it. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. In other words, that know not the Lord Jesus. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. But he writes, only those who know him can be saved through him. That we don't know. About that, I don't want to judge. I'd rather have this Christianity where everyone can find themselves if it doesn't offend anybody at all. I want to turn off the rock of offense. I want to turn off Jesus, basically speaking. Jesus is a rock of offense. The Bible says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Anyone who doesn't know Jesus goes to hell. Get it right. Another quote. It gets better. There are people in other religions. So let's take the Muslims, for example. There are people in other religions who are led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. Excuse me? So in other words, a Muslim who's being led by God, who's actually being led by a demon, to concentrate on those parts of the religion which are in agreement with Christianity. But there are actually a few things you can find in the Quran which agree with Christianity. And do you know what Islam is? It's basically just a, 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 a perversion and a blasphemous parody of Biblical Christianity. That's what the Quran is. The Quran is the ultimate garbage. It's the ultimate crap. You could just mock it all day long. It's just Christianity, extremely perverted. That's what Islam is. In Islam, you can find a lot of elements that agree with Christianity. You could actually find some. Obviously a perverted version. So when a Muslim is being led by God to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity, then he belongs to Christ without knowing it? I mean, if C.S. Lewis were living today, I would tell him to go to hell. Damnable false teacher! Do you know what? That's the same thing what Billy Graham taught. Oh, Billy Graham. He led a lot of people to Christ. He took a lot of people with him to hell. Billy, Billy, I'm Graham. He was also unfortunately invited to Germany to the pro-Christ event. Oh, a lot of people got saved at pro-Christ. You know, maybe a lot of people did get saved at pro-Christ. It was not through Billy Graham. Rather, through the really born-again Christians who were there, who talked with the people there. Because of these gospel meetings, some born-again Christians were there. Saved Christians took part. Who probably took him to the site and explained the gospel from the Bible and got him saved. That's how people got saved at the pro-Christ event. Was it by Billy Graham? No way! But by a born-again Christian who gave him the right gospel. It was a coincidence. It's exactly the same crap what Billy Graham preached. That someone who's from another religion, who's just following the light within his heart, belongs to the body of Christ without even knowing it. What a load of crap. You must know the Lord Jesus. You must know the gospel and believe the gospel. When you know nothing about the gospel, nothing about Jesus, then you're damned and you go to hell. It's that simple.
As I'm making this video against C.S. Lewis, especially about purgatory, I want to use this time to talk about purgatory, because I haven't preached about purgatory yet. And while on this topic, I want to prove to you that someone who believes in purgatory automatically believes in a false gospel and is not safe. Well, it doesn't have to be a surprise, because there's going to be people who are going to say, Oh, Brother Anzel, maybe he really believed in Jesus and is in heaven. Of course, there's no purgatory. You could have still believed in Jesus, right? No, anyone who believes in purgatory is definitely not saved. And the best way to explain that is quoting C.S. Lewis again, where he writes, Our souls demand purgatory, don't they? No, not my soul. Would it not break the heart if God said to us, It's true, my son, that your breath smells and your rags drip with mud and slime, but we are charitable in here, no one will upbraid you with these things, nor draw away from you. Enter into the joy. Should we not reply with submission, sir? And if there's no objection, I'd rather be clean first. It may hurt, you know. Even so, sir. What a bizarre and foolish statement. It's obvious here that C.S. Lewis did not understand the gospel. That's what people think who believe in purgatory is the perfect example. Because these people believe that they're not yet pure, they're like kind of saved, so to say, but, well, they go to heaven, but, but not really heaven, so they go to purgatory? In other words, they're not really saved, but still somehow saved. It's confusing. You're either saved or not saved. You see, the Bible is very clear when it comes to salvation. There are tough passages in the Bible, but not when it comes to the gospel. Salvation is easy. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says in John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, not will get it. After he is like purified sometime later. Sure is saved. He will go to heaven, but not really. He must first go to the purgatory. In other words, he's not really saved in the end. He still have to get more saved until he's like completely perfect. And then he goes to heaven. That's bizarre and stupid. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. In other words, I have eternal life right now. Everlasting means everlasting. There's no end. Whatever happens, I'll go to heaven. It's so simple. Or how about John 3.18? He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Salvation is not a process. So someone who believes in purgatory automatically believes that salvation is a process. It not only takes your entire lifetime, but it goes on after death. Because any logical person would have to agree that we will never be perfect in this life. So the thing, if I have to go to heaven, I'm gonna have to be perfect. Well, therefore, it's not just faith. You can't just believe and receive eternal life as a gift. Well, of course not. Well, we're gonna have to be sanctified. And God's gonna help us get sanctified. So, the process obviously goes further. After death, we'll never be perfect upon earth, therefore the process continues. So in other words, well, you are saved, of course. We will go to heaven, but you're not really saved though. So you have to be further saved. So you first have to go to the mini hell, the purgatory, and be purified from your sins. That's a bizarre and a dumb doctrine. It's a false gospel. It's work salvation. You have to be sanctified your whole life. You have to live in holiness. You cannot just believe and receive eternal life as a gift. And, well, God sanctifies you as well, right? In purgatory, you have to burn a little bit. Of course, it has to be painful. And you'll eventually get out. It's just baloney. Jesus did everything. Now, why this teaching is especially Blasphemous is because it attacks the blood of Jesus. You know, there's just a lot of ways to debunk this because it's so stupid and easy to debunk. It's a really clear false gospel. What C.S. Lewis believed, what anyone who believes in the purgatory is. But the biggest problem is that purgatory denies the blood of Jesus. How are we purified from our sins? How exactly are we washed from our sins, spiritually? Through the blood of Jesus, through His literal blood. I've already made a video on that. Link in the description below. There are actually two videos I made on the blood of Jesus. We are washed, washed clean from our sins through the blood of Jesus. But that's not what they believe, C.S. Lewis. They believe in purgatory. They don't believe that you're washed clean with the blood of Jesus. Oh no. You have to be further washed in the small hell, 
in purgatory. You first have to burn a little bit. They don't believe that the blood of Jesus is enough. They blaspheme the blood of Christ. It's a mockery. It's a false gospel. I don't have to say anything further, do I? What C.S. Lewis writes here, what I just quoted. It's so blasphemous, it's basically a parody. It's trying... It kind of looks as if... They want to drag the true gospel in the mud. When he's writing, it's true, my son. That's what, as if God would say. It's true, my son. Your breath smells and your rags drip with mud and slime. But we are charitable here and no one will braid you with these things nor draw away from you. Enter into the joy. He's dragging the true gospel, the biblical salvation, in the mud with a straw man argument. So what he's basically saying in this quote, all you guys who just believe in faith alone is condition for salvation. You're coming with all your rags. You're not really sanctified. If it's just faith alone, you're coming with all your rags. And if God would nevertheless say, just come on in. That's not possible, right? If you think about it, it's so obscene what he writes here. Hey, we are cleansed by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we're not carrying rags. In contrast to C.S. Lewis, true Christians are not trusting in their works, not in their holiness. Our hearts are purified by faith. That's what the Bible says. Not by good works. All our righteousness is like filthy rags, says the Bible. Oh, you're going to come with all your filthy rags, right? And would God really say, enter into the joy? That's not going to happen. That's what he's basically trying to convey. That's what he's saying. And it's such a disgusting straw man argument. Hey, we as real Christians are not trusting in our filthy rag. In contrast to C.S. Lewis, we are trusting in the righteousness of Christ. What we put on is not a filthy rag. I have upon me right now perfectly white garments. I'm absolutely not filthy. Well, maybe you're saying, but you still sin, right? You're right, but you know what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7? Through the Holy Spirit? And if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What Paul is saying is, the sin that I do, it's not me who does it. But why? Anyone who believes in Jesus is born again, and God creates in him a new person who's created in perfect holiness and in perfect righteousness, who cannot sin. Sure, we got our flesh with us, but guess what? Our flesh doesn't go to heaven. Only the inner man will go there. The new man, only the new creature will go there. And God's going to resurrect our bodies. Our bodies are going to be changed, which obviously are going to be sinless and perfect. But already now we have as born-again Christians a new creation in us, which will never sin. That's why it says in 1 John chapter 3, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What's born of God? Is it the old Anselm you're seeing right now? Is my flesh born of God? This body is going to decay. God's going to raise it up one day. And then he's going to change it one day. He's going to give a new body. And what's now born of God is the inner man, the new Anselm, which in fact never sins. That's what the Bible says. If I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This is the flesh, the old man. He doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand salvation. He doesn't understand the gospel, that we are already saved, that we are already made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 103, 12, As far as east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. What an amazing verse. You see, that's the gospel. That's biblical salvation. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Our transgressions, our sins, are not found any longer in us when it comes to salvation. Obviously, we're going to be chastised in this world for our sins because we have a choice every day to either walk in the flesh or in the spirit. That's why God will chastise us upon this earth. But that's got nothing to do with our salvation. When it comes to salvation, our sins have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. You see, the east and west are in opposite directions. They can never meet each other in the same way our sins will never meet us. We are saved as believing Christians who believe in the right gospel. 
We have eternal life. That's what he didn't understand. That's how people are who believe in purgatory. They don't understand biblical salvation. They don't understand the gospel. They believe salvation is a process that goes on after death because they still have to be sanctified. But not in the context of that God has cleansed our hearts, justified us by faith, that we have a new man which is born of God, that we have eternal life. But no, he means in the context of doing righteous works and that our sins must be burned up. You see, for any doctrine, whether it be true or false, there needs to be some support. Some verses have to be provided. Also for purgatory, there are verses that are abused to teach the doctrine of purgatory. They use this particular passage, 1 Corinthians 3, 11-15. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. See, that's the purgatory. No, that's the judgment seat of Christ. And notice what it's talking about. It's talking about if someone receives a reward or nothing. It's not talking about something like our sins are burned away or something. That, uh, that we are on our way to a mini hell to burn a little bit and suffer in pain till we are washed enough off our sins. Is that what we read here? No, what are we reading here? It's talking about the works of a saved, born-again Christian which are tested in fire. And what's the result of that? You either receive a reward for your works because they achieve something spiritually, you see, he served God with his good works. He did a lot of soul winning, or he just wasted his time away, and he did all meaningless works, and therefore he's going to suffer loss. He's not going to receive any reward. That's what this passage is talking about here. A believer may receive reward in heaven. He's already saved. He's got eternal life because it says, if any man's work shall be burned, works are burned. It's not talking about the person burning. This has got nothing to do with purgatory. The person himself is not going in fire. It's talking about his works which will be tested in fire. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Well, let's compare it to verse 14. He shall not receive a reward, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. So he is saved. He's got eternal life. He'll go to heaven. He's just talking about his works that will be tested. And unfortunately, he just wasted a lot of time and he's not going to get any reward. You see, there's just so many ways to debunk purgatory, this doctrine. But it's talking about purgatory in 1 Corinthians 3. I'm not going to go to all the verses. It's just a waste of time. It makes no sense. But I just want to show you a little bit what the Bible teaches in this chapter. I've already explained that only the works get tested. Notice with what the works of a Christian are compared with. If any man build upon this foundation, which is Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, and so on and so forth. Wood, hay, stubble, these are materials that will burn up, in contrast to materials like gold, silver, and precious stones. It doesn't mean that wood, hay, and stubble are automatically sinful things. Now, are materials like wood, hay, and stubble something bad? No. Is it automatically referring to sins? No. Let me give you an example. Every day we spend hours to sleep, to eat, to drink, do this and that, things that belong to our daily routine. Now, is it a sin to eat and drink? No. Do you think you're going to get rewarded in heaven for eating and drinking? No. So what kind of works are they? What do they mean? Wood, hay, stubble, which will burn. Were they sins? No. Were they something bad? No. It's just that you're not going to receive any reward for that. That's what it's talking about here. There are works for which you receive a reward. And there are, spiritually speaking, meaningless works which have no reward. 
which isn't something bad. Everyone's got works, which have to be done in daily life, for which you will not be rewarded. That's normal. It's not talking about sins that need purification. So what gets into the fire? It's only the materials that are mentioned here, which are symbolic to different works, which are tested in fire. Would the person himself go through fire? No, he doesn't say that. His works will be tested in fire. Some works still remain. Good job, you did soul winning. You have led people to Christ. You were a blessing to your brothers and many more. You will be rewarded for that. You're going to be ruling over many cities in the thousand year reign. That's what it's talking about. So whatever it is, stay away from C.S. Lewis. But you've got to have to reject the idea that that he's some Christian role model. Oh, C.S. Lewis. And his mere Christianity, he is a damnable false teacher who's burning in hell. How do I know that? It's because of the Bible. He believed in purgatory. Obviously, there's no such thing. So stay away from false Christian role models. I hate it how a lot of people often get quoted. You know, there are sermons where only C.S. Lewis gets quoted. Why? The guy wasn't even saved, even in independent churches. I hope this video has helped you. God bless you, see you later.